Thank you for joining us today for our Contemporary Translated Works Book Group, a seasonal book group that explores languages, cultures, and the art of translation through contemporary literature. I'm Nico Chen, and I am the program manager here at Mechanics Institute. Oh, Leslie Ann, you need to unmute. <laughs> Uh, Leslie Ann? Yes. Uh, can you unmute and uh, do your introduction? Oh, was it muted again? Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't looking at the video, so I couldn't see. I'm Leslie Ann Wufter, and I am the Public Programs Director at the Center for the Art of Translation. Thank you, Leslie Ann. And this book group at Mechanics Institute is co-presented with the Center for the Art of Translation. Aves Migratorias, or known in English as Migratory Birds, our fall selection celebrates Latinx Hispanic Heritage Month. Leslie Ann, can you also give us a quick overview of the Center for the Art of Translation? The Center for the Art of Translation is a San Francisco based nonprofit organization that champions literary translation. Our publications, events, and educational programming enrich the library of vital literary works, nurture and promote the work of translators, build audiences for literature and translation and honor the incredible linguistic and cultural diversity of our schools and our world. You can find out more about our publications and upcoming events at catranslation.org. And Mechanics Institute was founded in 1854 and is one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. We feature a full service general interest library, an internationally renowned chess club, ongoing author and literary programs, and the cinema lit film series. We also host a number of book groups, such as our bi-weekly World Literature Book Group and our monthly Brown Bag Mystery Readers, and our quarterly Deep Dive into Design Book Group and Cookbook Club. This is our second session of the Contemporary Translated Works Book Group, and we are delighted that you have joined us for this transnational literary journey. This journey continues today with Migratory Birds by Mariana Oliver, a collection of interconnected essays is that ruminates on migration between real cities and other spaces such as language, memory, and the body. In case you haven't gotten your copy of Migratory Bird Jet, we recommend purchasing a copy directly from the publisher, Transit Books. For the recorded part of our gathering today, we will begin with an introductory conversation with Julia Sanchez, who translated Migratory Birds from Spanish into English. From noon to 12.30 p.m., our introductory conversation with Julia will explore how language, culture, and the art of translation shapes this work. At around 12.30 p.m. Pacific time, we will move into a Q&A. So if any questions emerge for you that you want to ask Julia, please make sure to type your questions into the chat box, which you will find on the bottom of the Zoom screen uh, to your right. I think to your right for most of us, okay. Or if you are on site here at Mechanics Institute, please write it on an index card that we have provided here in the boardroom space. For readers who want to discuss the book informally, you have the option to stay for our informal discussion from 12.45 to 1.30 p.m. to delve even deeper into migratory birds. Uh, now that I have announced all of the logistical details of today's gathering, I'd like to pivot into our introductory conversation with Julia Sanchez. And before we jump into this, Leslie Ann, can you also introduce Julia Sanchez to our audience? Yes. Julia Sanchez is a literary translator working from Spanish, Portuguese, and Catalan into English. Recent translations include Living Things by Munir Hachemi and Reservoir Bitches by Dalia de la Serra, co-translated with Heather Cleary. Born in Brazil, Julia currently resides in Providence, Rhode Island. But she's joining us from New Haven today. <laughs> well, my first question for Julia is, we started with your professional bio, but we would also love to learn more about your linguistic autobiography. So how might people understand who you are through the lens of language? Um, first of all, thank you both. That was the smoothest introduction to an event I have ever experienced. <laughs> and I'm truly delighted to be um, beaming in to San Francisco from New Haven. Um, it's my first time here, so I can't tell you what it's like outside the hotel room I am currently in. Um, I love the idea of a linguistic autobiography. I don't know who came up with that, but it's fantastic. Um, and it's much more interesting to me than, you know, born here, went to school here, 
did some professional stuff here. Um, I was born to a Brazilian family in Brazil, but I left when I was very young and moved to the United States. We lived in New York, New Jersey, and then a bit further north um, in Putnam County. And so I would speak English at school and Portuguese with my family. And this family included the Brazilian family we'd visit once a year around Christmas time and spend like three to four weeks with them. Um, I found out in my adulthood, <laughs> I think maybe like five years ago, that when I was a kid, I would, and we went to visit family in Brazil, I would go silent, entirely silent for like a week while I um, acclimatized to the new language and culture that I was entering. And then I would open my mouth and just speak seamless Portuguese, um, like a, the tiny little Brazilian that I was. And then the same thing would happen in reverse when I came to the back to the United States. The teachers would get really freaked out and want to know if I was okay because I was generally quite um, chatty and suddenly I was this tomb. Um, but anyway, that sort of is my my language autobiography until I was around eight years old when I moved to Mexico City. Um, and I lived there for around five to six years and I spoke very Mexican, like Mexico City Spanish, but Mexico City from a certain class as well, what we, what we would call in Spanish fresa. Um, and then my my Spanish was sort of distorted when I lived in um, in Spain. I lived in Catalonia for for three years, where I did my master's degree, and that's where I learned Catalan as well. Um, and in between, there was also Switzerland and Scotland, in fact. And so my English is also a little bit strange. And if I'm really, really, really tired, I'll say aubergine and courgette instead of zucchini and eggplant. Um, and I've had to teach myself to say progress instead of progress and um, buoy instead of boy <laughs> and all of these different um, ways of pronouncing English. Um, I consider myself a heritage translator, which means that I translate from the languages of my upbringing. And I count Catalan and Spanish in those, even though we spoke Portuguese in my family, because my family were actually fairly recent immigrants to Brazil, and they were from um, Spain and Catalonia specifically. And so it was sort of kismet that I ended up translating from these languages. I don't, I speak French-ish, <laughs> kind of Swiss French, um, but I don't translate from French. I think that maybe I'm missing that um, effective bond, maybe, from that language. That was a bit rambly. <laughs> Apologies. No, you have a fascinating linguistic biography. <laughs> Thank you for sharing with us. I um I want to talk more about your bond with Swiss French or lack of bond with Swiss French at some point in the future. But for now, I can see so many similarities between your linguistic biography and what I read in Migratory Birds. Um, I could hazard guesses on what drew you to this work, but I'd rather hear it from you. Um, <laughs> could you share a little bit about Migratory Birds and Mariana Oliver and also what drew you to this work in particular? Sure. Um, so Migratory Birds is this very slim collection of essays that sort of um, circles around the topic of migration and I think belonging and home. Um, which also is, of course, contained in the idea of migration. Um, I came across it on the website Letras Libres, which at some point, I, I don't know if I've just like fabricated this memory, but we're going to go with it. They used to have this interactive map and you could see the essays they'd published by writers in different places. And because I'd grown up partly in Mexico, I was very drawn to um, writing from that country. And I was also drawn to the idea of non-American or Anglo writers writing about other places, sort of writing outside their biography, writing outside. Um, sort of, there's a sort of sometimes this anthropological slant that gets 
imposed on translated literature and I wanted to translate outside that. So I was drawn to the idea of a Mexican writer writing about, is it Bill Lishman? <laughs> Who's famous because of the, the movie Fly Away Home with Anna Paquin, <laughs> though that never gets brought up um, in the essay. Um, yeah, I was drawn to the idea of how generously also she writes about um, figures from outside her home country. Mariana is an endlessly fascinating writer. Um, and uh, she recently finished her PhD where she studied specifically exophonic writers. So writers who do not write in their so-called mother tongues, um, like the Turkish German writer who's referred to in um, one of the essays, Ozdemar's tongue. Um, and like Yoko Tawada who writes in both Japanese and German and countless other authors. And so she is interested in the spaces where um, belonging is blurred and questioned. So um, she questions the idea of borders. She questions the idea of um, the nation state being tied to specific languages. And obviously, as you can see from my linguistic autobiography, um, borders are a nuisance and it can be a little bit limiting. That's uh, a very, not very deep <laughs> way of referring to borders, but, you know, bear with me. <laughs> of course. Um, would you like to share a little bit from the book, maybe reading some in Spanish and then some in English, please? Sure. Um, so I'm going to reverse the order. I'm going to do a little bit in English and then a little bit in Spanish for purely practical reasons which is that the first paragraph I'm going to read is actually quite long. <laughs> and I'll read the short paragraph in Spanish at the end. So this is from the essay I referred to called Osdemar's Tongue, which is the second essay actually translated in the collection, even though it's a few essays in. Um, I translated it first for Words Without Borders, speaking of borders, um, for this portfolio on Mexican women essayists. And uh, a disclaimer, I do not speak German. And so I will <laughs> absolutely butcher the pronunciation of these German words. So apologies. <laughs> Languages betray the shortcomings and inclinations of those who speak them. Germany is also a land for people with nostalgic tendencies. There are several German nouns for nostalgia. Sensucht. Frenve, nostalgie, vemut, heimve. This last word consists of two parts that, when combined with other words, designate particular sensations. Ve means pain or sorrow, while heim is also is often translated as house or home. Heim can also be used to form other nouns such as heimat, which can be translated as home country and refers to the relationship a person has with the place where they grew up and learned to speak, as well as with the feelings and experiences of their childhood. Heimat is a connection to land and language crucial to the formation of identity. A derivative of this noun exists in the adjective unheimlich, the negation of heim, often translated into Spanish as siniestro or ominoso, and into English as sinister or uncanny. Unheimlich speaks of a thing that breaks with the familiar in day to day, generating a sense of unease. The first recorded use of, heim of heimweh dates to the 12th century in Switzerland. The fact that the word had appeared in specialist medical texts to describe a heightened, unrelenting sadness is not surprising. Heimve is as sickness. Heimve was exported to other German-speaking countries in the Romantic era, and until then had only ever been used in the medical field. Agglutination is the bedrock of the German language. Nouns, adjectives, and other particles are strung together to create new meaning. There are hierarchies in these constructions. The last part always designates the object referred to, while the preceding words vest it with specific qualities. In principle, heimve means pain, but not just any pain. It is a pain felt for home, for a place that has been lost, for a language, for something we think of as ours and which is missing. Sometimes words and their nuances serve as thermometers. Ozamar's nostalgia is not nostalgia, it is heimve. 
We should adopt words across languages into our everyday vernacular, pronounce them as confidently as we do those of our childhood, mark them with our accents, voice modulations, and necessary pauses, speak them as though they were ours, find a context for them in which their meanings explode and envelop us, turn our mother tongues into open spaces that can accommodate any word we choose or happen to come across, recognize others for the words they've chosen, say home, body or ghost in any language and assume every nuance. One moment, as I pull up the Spanish. Deberíamos adoptar palabras de cualquier idioma en nuestro lenguaje cotidiano, pronunciarlas con la seguridad con la que articulamos las palabras de la infancia, imprimirles nuestro acento, la modulación de nuestra voz, las pausas necesarias, decirlas como si fueran nuestras, encontrarles un contexto donde su significado explote, nos revista. Hacer de la lengua materna un espacio abierto donde quepa cualquier palabra que elijamos o hallemos por casualidad en momentos precisos. Reconocer a los demás por las palabras que han escogido. Decir hogar, cuerpo o fantasma en la lengua que sea y apropiarnos de tu todos sus matices. Thank you. I love that, that line from... Um this book that talks about taking words and making their, them your own. I can imagine that it was pretty, um, I guess, probably uh, all translations are difficult, of course, but it's interesting to translate between Spanish and German and English and put all that together um, in one in one sentence in that way. Um, could you talk a little bit more about your translation process with this? Um, did you work closely with Mariana? Um, and then how, how did this work come to be in, in print? So I'm going to have to cast my mind way back <laughs> sort of to the pandemic era. Um, so I've already spoken about how I came across the essay. I actually, the first essay I translated was the one about uh, Bill Lishman, the um, pilot with the birds. Um, the geese specifically, no, the cranes, I think it was the cranes. Yeah. Whooping cranes. Yeah. Yeah. Whooping cranes. And I translated that one and sent it around to several magazines and had either resounding silence or no <laughs> uh, rejections from them. And then, um, my friend and colleague, Charlotte Whittle, who also translates from Spanish pitched this portfolio of women, mes um, Mexican women essayists, two words without border and included, um, the the essay about Ozdemar, Ozdemar's tongue, and an essay by Karen Villeda, and I think Hasmina Barrera, who was published by Two Lines, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and when the essay was published, Al um, Adam, Adam Levy, not Alex, Adam Levy uh, reached out to me. We'd known each other for a few years, and he asked if I'd be interested in translating the book, which was the easiest <laughs> way a book can possibly happen in translation. I was kind of, I was kind of surprised because people were so uninterested in the essay on its own that I thought that I had very low chances of publishing the collection. Maybe I'm just a cynic. <laughs> um, that's also a possibility. Um, in terms of my translation process, I did work with Mariana, but not that, I mean, not like sitting side by side and getting our hands dirty in the text at the same time, but we communicated on WhatsApp as I often do with my Latin American um, authors. Whenever she was speaking about, there's a, there's a section where she mentions words that come from Arabic in, and that are used in Spanish and that I had to change in English because we don't use the same words. We do have words that come from Arabic, but they're not the same ones. And I had to make sure that the ones I chose, um, this is going to be put, it to, to put, I'm going to put it very plainly, but had the right vibe <laughs> that fit with, with the essay. Um, there were also some little details that she'd gotten wrong because there's in fact checking. And also because I was working with Adam Levy, who is, really into bird watching. And so he knew things about birds that maybe um, Mariana or I did not. And so there was that kind of um, involvement. I 
remember having some trouble with the opening of essays because she actually has quite vivid um, scene setting openings. And so I would spend, spend quite a lot of time tr making sure that I was being just as evocative in English. I did get to, I think I may, I must have asked some German translators friends to tell me a little bit about the German nuances, but I also just trusted Mariana to know because she teaches German. Um, so it's not like I was being <laughs> led by someone who had no idea about this language and was just using it as a springboard. Now she knows German intimately. Um, and so I just sort of it's 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 a wonderful feeling to be able to um, trust entirely in the author you're translating, um, which isn't always the case. Um, the, I mean, the other parts of my translation process are possibly really, really boring and nitty gritty. Just, you know, you forge ahead and then I have this habit of, I translate in spirals, if that makes sense. So... I will translate, say, a thousand words in a day. And then the following day, before I translate new words, I edit the thousand words I'd done the previous day to keep the tone alive and to keep the voice consistent. I find that returning to what I did the previous day helps me. Um, and it just means that even though I'm moving quite slowly, what I'm creating tends to be quite polished. By the time I get to the end of my first draft, there are still questions obviously, because I, I try to bombard my authors with questions only at the very end of the process, instead of like emailing them every two days being like, what do you mean? <laughs> um, and where did you get this quotation? Authors are really, really bad at keeping track of their sources. Um, and so I'll find myself trying to figure like back translating to try to figure out where this is from. Um, but yes, I'm sure there's something I've missed. <laughs> um, reading aloud is also really important, which um, it is for Mariana as well. When we were look, when we were thinking through this sentence with a new Arabic word, she wanted me to record myself reading it to her so she could hear it and see if it worked rhythmically. Thank you so much for sharing um, your fascinating translation process, Julia. And um, I want to kind of move into um, the essay form. And so, you know, I also work as an English teacher. And usually when we are writing essays, I tell my students that the essays are often explaining something or arguing something. But I sense that this collection of essays is doing something a little different. So from your translation process and your deep work with this um, interconnected collection of essays, what do you think that Migratory Birds is doing? Is it explaining something or arguing something or is it doing something else? I would say that if it's explaining or arguing, it's doing it very much in the background. And what it's actually doing is presenting information and presenting new ways of looking at that inform at, uh, at that information. Um, Mariana is very interested in, at least in this essay, <laughs> in this essay collection, she seems particularly interested in the people who are sort of forgotten by history. So women, American policies in Cuba that, you know, these big historic moments, but she focuses on, you know, she focuses on the children in Cuba who ended up being sent away after the CIA frightened Cuban parents into thinking the Cuban government was going to steal their children. Um, she focuses on the women who helped rebuild um, Berlin. Um, she has this essay about Krista Wolf as well. So she's sort of gazing, turning her gaze at um, people who might usually be overlooked. But I don't see her as having this, making an argument exactly. There's this beautiful tradition right now. I don't know if you can call it a tradition since it's happening currently, but Mexican specifically Mexican women essayists who are presenting, who are writing essays in this very fragmentary form. It's almost imagistic 
Um, Hasmina Barrero does that as well in her essays, and so does Mariana Oliver. So you'll have these short lyrical sections um, where they're meditating on something. And yeah, I feel Mariana and Hasmina have a very similar, not to use this word again, vibe. <laughs> Um, and interest as well, and interests. Did that Thank help so essay form? I was scared of that question. I was like, oh, people have written so much about the essay form and I don't know any of it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's fascinating to sort of just hear your interpretation because I think that sometimes we think that the essay should have an answer, but I think through your um, sharing of what she is doing, it almost makes me think about like, the open question, right? The essay kind of expanding upon a question rather than having to cinch into an answer explicitly and immediately. Um, I wanna move on to the topic of culture. Um, these essays, while originally written in Spanish by someone who was born in Mexico City, cannot quite be contained within the confines of Mexican culture. And it kind of reminds me of this anthropologist by the name of uh, Clifford Kiertz, who talks about the study of culture as actually porous, as leaky containers. And these essays kind of show us how these um, cultural and national boundaries are not only porous, but also politically violent at times. Uh, it's a work that is international and transcultural in scope. And so when translating this work, how are you making sense of this thing that we call culture? Do, um, does your understanding of culture shift as you are also translating this work? Because of my itinerant upbringing, I think of culture as these codes or as this like space that you have to step into and adapt to and figure out in order to move more smoothly through a new, a new place. Um, and I think I get the sense, maybe this is just me projecting, um, that this is how she's also presenting culture as this um, very much created um, almost space that you that you enter. I, I'm trying to think of when trying. How are you making sense of how am I making sense of culture? Um, I don't think my understanding of culture shifted because it was already as expansive as hers, perhaps. And also, I mean, I've heard people say, I might be going on a tangent, forgive me if so, but I've heard people say that you that you shouldn't translate from um, an author from a country you've never spent a long amount of time in. And I have some problems with that position, if only because you can spend a lot of time in the United States and still not understand the culture of Wyoming. And you can spend a lot of time in Mexico and still not understand the culture of Aguascalientes and same with Brazil and not understand the culture of Salvador de Bahia. Um, there are so many different little pockets of culture within what we consider the wider culture, which is often tied to um, a language or a nation state. And I guess my I've always had this sense of the malleability of culture, so I'm not sure if it shifted, but it was a great experience to be in the company of someone who <laughs> had similar feelings about these things that we see as being very much concrete and set in stone, but they aren't. Um, especially in terms of national boundaries, the entire relationship between the United States and Mexico changed with the solidifying of the border when that area used to be so much more porous. Um, I also, since moving, I've been in the US now for 10 years, or at least this, this part of my life, I've been here for 10 years. And I've always found it quite shocking how a historical the people's ahistorical view on migration as if the migration into the United States had nothing to do with the U.S.'s foreign policy in the last few decades. So, for example, I translated this author called Claudia Hernandez, Rosa Tumba Quema, which is about the aftermath of a civil war in a nameless country in Latin America. And I was translating it around the same time 
and she's Salvadoran, so you get the sense that it's about El Salvador, but she never names it. And around the same time, Trump had revoked the temporary protected status of, was trying to revoke the temporary protected status of Salvadorans, even though the U.S. was elbow deep in um in the in the civil war and in the politics of like every country in latin america which be hard to say it would be challenging to say that that has nothing to do with current patterns of migration into the u.s i've gone off on a huge tangent i'm really sorry <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Julia. And I want to also um, just ask our audience today, if you happen to have any questions that are emerging, to go ahead and add it into the chat box, or if you are in the Mechanics Institute portal right now, to write it on an index card and share it with us. Both me and Leslie Ann have a lot of questions that we can ask, but we also want to hear your questions as well. Uh, since I don't see anything in the chat box right now, I'll move on to the next question. Um, you know, the this book, this beautiful book, Migratory Birds, it takes us to so many different places, such as Germany, Cuba, Turkey, um, and so forth. Are there any places in Migratory Birds that you would like to travel to and research more, and why? Um, Cuba. <laughs> I've always wanted to, to visit Cuba, and for the longest time, I was scared to because I had a, I had a green card, and I thought I knew it could impact my bid for citizenship, and so I never did. And I've now been a citizen for a couple of years, and I just haven't had the time to spend to spend in Cuba. But that's been on my list for at least twenty to twenty five years. Um, I have a very, even though I'm, I love translating these books from a wide variety of places. I have very mixed feelings about tourism in general. <laughs> so I, I tend to be a bit of a homebody and I will go places if if summoned, but um, rarely make the, make the leap myself. Were there any that you would have been interested in going to or like any essays that you would have wanted to spend more time in physically? Maybe Krista Wolf's apartment? <laughs> I definitely want to go to Cappadocia, if that's how you say it. I um, When I was reading the book um, like for the second time, I realized that I did know that city because there was some influencer on Instagram that was posting traveling there. And I was, oh, it's that place. And it changed my entire reading of it because then I immediately had a visual, which I didn't have the first time I read it. So I, I would love to travel there. Um I think it'd be fascinating to travel there having read this essay now than, than before. Um, yeah. Nico, how about you? Uh, let me let me pin myself first before I speak. Um, you know, I've actually been to Cappadocia, and I would say that if you are a wine lover, it's a surprisingly wine, like, like th there's beautiful restaurants in caves, and the wine is surprisingly delicious there. The, um, I guess the uh, volcanic ash that covers the area produces delicious wines. And it's just something that I just did not expect. Like coming from California with the, with the beautiful wines, I thought that there was, you know, like wine um, deserts um, in, in other parts of the world that I just don't know where that wine came from. But um, Cappadocia is just such a fascinating place that we, we should all visit together someday if we can manage to get that chance. But I do want to move to another question that someone asked. Um, Casey asked, you mentioned you translated the essays out of order. Was the order of the essays re revisited during the translation? Was there a through line or journey you wanted to create or present in your translation? And do you feel like you had to keep in mind how the essays connect together during your translation? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, I translated the essays out of order before I had a contract for the book. And then by the time I had a contract for the book, if, um, Mariana had actually published another version. I think maybe I had one additional essay in it in Colombia. So she's been published by small presses and the, the one in Mexico was attached to 
I think the Fondo, Cult Fondo Nacional de Cultura, so it's like a government body, and she won a prize for it, and that's how it, it was published. And then after it was published, um, a small press in Colombia um, took it on, and I just sort of forgot the Mexican edition at all and focused on the Colombian edition because it was the most recent one. Um, I'm very bad at looking at like taking a step back and looking at at the book as a whole when I'm translating because I'm so um, tuned in to the smaller decisions that need to be made. Like I'm very much focused on the line level and I almost, um, I heavily rely on editors to help me take that step back <laughs> and have a more global view. There are also time constraints in that I have to work quite quickly. Um, when I submitted the book to, to Adam, I can't remember exactly what he said, but it was something along the lines of, why didn't you tell me that this is more like a book sort of circling obsessively over the idea of migration? Like, why did you like pitch this as a collection of essays? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> this is not, my forte is not sort of looking at things um, um, from, from afar. I think, I mean, I think she does a very good job herself at creating a through line and at, um, exploring these issues and building on them. It's kind of wonderful that she ends the entire collection at home. And she also reveals this little bit about herself toward the very end where she's, she, one of my favorite essays is actually the last one, which is, um, blueprint for a house and she has a section at the very end where she says I've always wondered if a stranger walking through our house while we were out would have to go as far as the bedroom before realizing that two women live under this roof mm -hmm. and you just don't um you don't know because she's very much not in most of these essays, even though, you know, she, we have her voice, we have her perspective, we have the way she is structuring things. And every so often we have an eye. She's quite hidden. Um, and then she reveals herself at the very end in the home, which is like the most intimate place um, after going all over, not all over the world, but, you know, various <laughs> parts of the world and parts of history as well. I have another question here from the audience from Sarah. So I loved hearing your process and linguistic bio. I'm curious about the website you mentioned where you found essays to translate. I missed the name of it. Can you mention it again? Um, Sarah, I put it in the chat at the um, top. I'll put it back in the chat real quickly for you. Um, and then it says, um, I work primarily with poets from Lima, Peru, who have been published there, but have yet to reach a broader audience. And I'd like to continue, continue finding more insight into um, how to begin pitching works in translation and how to do that. Do you have any suggestions for Sarah about how to pitch works in translation and how to get started? Mm -hmm. um, with a lot of dedication and also just steal yourself for some heartbreak. <laughs> because you might find that you fall in love with a book and someone else is already pitching it or working on it. Um, I think I'm, I'm a bit of a bo broken record on this point, but find your community and ask people for help. Um, generally, everyone is willing, most translators I know are really uh, willing to share to share whatever resources they've acquired while they were also going through this process. Um, scouting, I think, is actually one of the hardest parts of translation, like trying to find the next thing to work on because you have to, one, speaking of borders, figure out how to get books from Mexico to the United States. In my case, it took me a really long time to get Mariana Oliver's book because I was trying to buy it and they wanted to charge me like $25 in shipping when the book itself had cost five. Um, but, and also then you have to trust your taste, um, which I find a little challenging as well, because you have to not only trust that what you found is really good, 
but trust that others will also think it's really good to the point that they'd be willing to put money into having it translated <laughs> by you, preferably. Um, but yeah, just uh, go to find translation communities wherever you are. Um, for poets from Lima, I would look at Cardboard House Press. They publish poetry and translation from Spanish specifically. And they, the editor, Giancarlo Guapaya, is himself Peruvian. Yeah, I hope that was helpful. There's, there's a whole other sort of discussion on this. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big topic. We can have a whole event yeah, around this so much. in the future. <laughs> yeah. It would work well. Um, I think I have time for one last question. And I always like to close these types of conversations with asking you what you're working on currently, or if there's anything in your field that you're particularly excited about these days. What I'm working on currently. Um, I am toggling between two projects at the moment, which is not ideal, but it's how my schedule ended up looking. I'm co-translating a book um, with Zoe Perry from the Portuguese. It's a novel by, it's a true crime novel by Carol Ben Simon, who is based in California, in Mendocino specifically. Um, and the, the main character, we see her um, at different points of her life. At one point, she's in a, you know, a woman in her 40s working as a taxidermist in California. And in the other parts, in the other half of the book, she is in, she's a young girl in Brazil whose father is being charged for murder. So true crime, way outside my wheelhouse, but it's been fun. It's nice to have someone else to work with on this because it's not my usual, you know, lyrical essay mode. Um, and the other book I'm translating is also way outside my wheelhouse. It's a sci-fi novel about translation by Munira Chemi. And it's, he's, he himself is a translator from Chinese and English into Spanish. He translated Ling Ma um my uh, severance into spanish and so and he has he speaks arabic english spanish french and chinese um yes polyglot and he just has a really interesting perspective on on translation so and he really likes playing with form and so this is a novel disguised as an anthropological report by an archaeologist he, in 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 the book our anthropology and archaeology are the same um subject and the archaeologists have gone to visit this culture in a place that you don't you don't quite know where you are until the very end i'm going to try not to give things away but um, there are lots of different forms there are like diary entries and there are reports and um there are sort of more religious texts and I get to um insert myself into it as well because we're pretending that we're translating this official report and so it's been translated into Spanish and I'm the person translated in it into English from an invented language but yeah outside <laughs> outside my wheelhouse I'm gonna have to read a lot of Ursula Le Guin <laughs> there, there are worse things to do there right are. <laughs> that's a fascinating okay. project I can't wait to read that one <laughs> that's good I just gotta gotta get through it yeah okay. yes <laughs> yeah. I want to talk to you more about that that's great um let's see I think that's all we have time for today um wow. if you were interested in Spanish to English translations you can join the Center for the Art of Translation um for an event on Friday October 4th at 7 p.m. Mexican author Yuri Herrera will join translator Lisa Dillman at Green Apple Books on the Park for a reading from Season of the Swamp, followed by a conversation with um, Tommy Orange. You can find that information at the link in the chat. And I want to thank Julia Sanchez again for this delightful conversation. And I also want to announce our next selection for our Contemporary Translated Works book group. It is Tongueless by Law I, Law I Wa, translated from Cantonese into English by Jennifer Feely. This recently published psychological thriller 
is steeped in the ongoing social linguistic tensions that are currently happening in Hong Kong. We'll be discussing this book as our winter selection in December, and we'll be posting that um, extended info on the Mechanics Institute website soon. We also recommend purchasing a copy directly uh, from Feminist Press. And we'll actually have both La Lao Yi Hua and Jennifer Feely here in San Francisco for an event at the Ruby on Wednesday, October 30th. So please register for this upcoming event and you can meet both the author and translator of Tongueless in person if you happen to be in San Francisco. Before we transition into our informal book discussion on migratory birds with the participants here today, we'll need to bid goodbye to Julia. So if you feel comfortable, I do welcome you to turn on your cameras and wave a goodbye. <laughs> it's so good to see everyone here. Thank you for being here today. Stephanie Nisbet um, says, thank you, Julia, um, in the chat box. And Julia, um, we are going to ask you to leave so that we can have a private informal conversation with the participants. Thank you, Julia. Thank you so much for having me um, and for spotlighting this book. <laughs>